the war on corrosion. It never ends on a bridge. On the 75-year-old Westman, the main cables are periodically exposed to check for water damage. On the new Bay Bridge, the main cable is being armed from the beginning to fight a war that will last its lifetime. Hi, and welcome back to Bay Bridge 360. I'm Bart Ney, your host, and this is the third in a trilogy of videos where we're looking at constructability challenges for the new Bay Bridge. In the first episode, we looked at concrete placement and how archers deal with challenges in doing massive concrete pours. In the second episode, we looked at steel post tensioning and how we take post tensioning ducts and run steel cables through them to give the bridge extra strength and lift. In this episode, we're going to look at one of the biggest challenges to any steel bridge. Whether it's an all steel bridge or one with steel inside of it, corrosion is a challenge that we face from the time we buy the steel all the way through the lifespan of the bridge. In today's episode, we're going to take you all the way to the top of the Bay Bridge, self-anchored suspension bridge, main tower, and look at our dehumidifiers and how we fight corrosion up there. And also deep inside the belly of the Skyway, right above my head, where we'll look at some of the post-tensioning ducts there and how we dealt with corrosion challenges there. The war on corrosion, next on Bay Bridge 360. Well, here we have our main cable, the real workhorse of this bridge. And it's made up of individual five millimeter diameter wires. 17,399 of them. So it's critical that we protect this cable against any type of rest and corrosion. It starts with each individual wire. Each one of them is galvanized to protect against rust. And then after the, the bridge is completely put at its final position, we put weight on the suspender cables right here, we can begin the process of coating this cable with a zinc-based paste. We coat bay to bay between these individual cable bands all the way down the cable. And then on top of that, we have this, our S-wire wrap. Basically, the S-wire wrap is laid around the outside of the bridge. And this one actually has notches in it so that it interlocks and can slide directly in. So that wraps around the outside of the bridge like this all the way bay to bay between these cable bands. And then on top of this S-wire wrap, we have two coats of a noxide-based paint that almost form a gasket on the outside of this S-wire wrap. Two additional coats of paint are put on the outside of that. Now there are some parts of the main cable though that don't have this S-wire wrap, like the very top of the bridge. Well, we made it. We're 525 feet in the air at the very top of the world's largest self-anchored suspension bridge. And underneath my feet is the main cable saddle. The main cable, only one of them, comes up over the top of the bridge right here. It goes down, loops around the back end of the bridge, comes back up and crosses here again. So this area right here is an area where we really have to watch corrosion with that cable going over it twice. And at this point, we don't have the wire wrap or the zinc-based paste, everything's exposed. So what we do is we use dehumidifiers. Big, almost like air conditioning units that suck the moisture out of the air and out of the area where the steel is. Follow me, I'll show you. All right, now I'm inside the, one of the tower legs right above the main saddle for the uh, main cable of the bridge. And you can see where I'm pointing down here, these holes have been cut into the chamber below where the main cable is. In that area, we don't have the wire wrapping around the outside of it. So what we're gonna do is dehumidify it, pull the moisture out. So these holes that you see here will have ducts that connect into the dehumidifier unit above my head. And on one end, we'll be sucking the moisture out of that chamber. And on the other end, the return supply will be pumping dry air in. So we always keep that area um, really dry and we can fight corrosion that way. Well, that is one area where we use a dehumidifier to take care of potential corrosion issues. There are actually a total of five units that we use on this bridge. That one is the smallest one. We have two units on the eastern side of the bridge, one in each one of the anchor points where the cable splays out to keep it dry. Then we have another one 500 feet beneath my feet at the base of this tower and one more at the very back end of the bridge where the cable wraps around. These are areas where we don't have the wire wrap anymore and we just basically use the dehumidification system to make sure that we don't have a problem with corrosion. Well we've looked at a few of the ways that we prevent corrosion on our steel bridges and our steel components. But what happens when we actually encounter corrosion during construction? On the 1.2 mile long Skyway I'm walking on right now, we actually had that challenge. And at a public speaker series, 
one of our chief design engineers, Dr. Brian Maroney, discussed how we met that challenge. This is a shot of the Skyway when it's cantilevered out. Now cantilevered means it's basically only being supported on one end and it wants to sag down. So what we do is we don't just take reinforcing steel, we bring in pre-stressing steel. That steel is five times stronger than regular steel. Okay? Regular plate steel is like 50,000 pounds per square inch. Pre-stressing steel is 270,000 pounds per square inch. Okay? So it's really, really strong. Here's a challenge that we faced. I want to walk you through uh, what we did. Um, we found on the Skyway that there were some uh, vents, grouting vents, that had broken off. We put high strength grout inside those ducts to fill up all the voids. The tendons, the pre-stressing tendons, don't completely fill those ducts. So once we're done pre-stressing and, and erecting the structure and loading it up, we actually fill in or fill those ducts with, with grout. And we do it through the vents, but we also let the air out through those vents, but they need to be capped. What we found out was um, some trucks had probably run over them and they had broken off. And then when it rained, water got inside those ducts. Water and steel don't work very well. Okay. Next slide. So as soon as we discovered this, the first thing we did is we put together a team. Um, we put, brought together um, all the elements of a team that we needed to evaluate and figure out exactly what we needed to do. First thing you have to do is get as smart as you possibly can about it. And what we did is we went to areas where we could get access to those. Okay, kind of like if you have a problem with your knee, you're not going to want to open up your leg, you just want to open up a little hole. So what we did is we went to strategic locations where we knew we could get access to it. So here's a shot of, uh, of an opening at the top of a deck. Next slide. Now we're going to zoom in on a little bit so you can actually see in this opening, you can see those pre-stressing um, strands, right? And what we did is we, um, we brought in new technology. Uh, what I have in my hand here is a digital bore scope. that to actually see the strand right down inside. I'm going to go ahead and articulate the camera head and we're able to get down inside the tube now. And now we're going to go ahead and run it down. So my right is the direction of the spacing. You're able to see right down this tube. We can see the condition that the strand is in. We can see if there's any uh, anything in there, water, rust. And this was just fantastic. And actually, Jason, if I remember right, when, um, when this was purchased, you, know, you, were, you were the first person in the United States at a DOT that had this equipment, is that right? So, you know, a, a first. This is from the borescope, and again, it's, you look at it and you go, whoa, this is, the, this is the same tendon when you lay it out and you just look at it without the magnification, right? And then this one, same tendon, it was cleaned up and kind of unspun, unwound, right? And this is what it looks like, okay? Next slide. Then we took some of those wires, because when we saw some of this, we actually, when we see um, a pitting, that is a change of surface, we get concerned about stress concentrations. And in some cases, we said, get it out. Take it out, putting in a new tendon. We also involved FHWA and their corrosion experts uh, on the East Coast. Um, and uh, we actually also had the, um, uh, the peer review panel, um, external independent peer review panel with Joe Nicoletti looking over our shoulders on this. And at the end, what we, uh, what we had statistical information, strong engineering information, that something like one and a half percent of the strands uh, had what we termed moderate uh, corrosion. That means we were losing about um, about five percent, something like that, of, of their strength. What's the right balance? And we went through an evaluation of how much extra do we have? And we, uh, we reviewed our calculations and we had about 10 percent extra pre-stressing. Right? So we got like 10% extra, and that's on top of code factors of safety and capacity reduction factors. All right, I've made my way back up to the top of the Bay Bridge, but we're ready to close out our episode on corrosion. Eternally vigilant is what we have to be to make sure that our bridges are up to spec and ready for the next earthquake. This is also the end of our trilogy of videos on constructability challenges that we've had with the Bay Bridge. But we still have a little ways to go. We've got a little less than a year until we put this bridge into public service. So come back to Bay Bridge 360 to see more information on what we're doing to get this bridge ready. Until then, I'm Bart Ney and, and I think I'm going to take in the view. Take care. See you next time.